great host for this event tonight. And I'm pleased to be welcoming tonight's presenter, occupational therapist Elizabeth Lombard, who is here to help demystify sensory processing and make parenting a little easier. After her presentation, there will be some time to ask questions, and I will be passing this mic around so the folks that are watching at home can hear all the questions on the live stream. So at this time, make sure to silence your cell phones. And without further ado, I will turn it over to our presenter this evening, Elizabeth Lombard. Thank you so much, Laura. <laughs> and I have to apologize. My voice does not normally sound like this. So it's sort of funny to be talking about sensory differences. And for some people, hearing a voice that doesn't sound good might be incredibly difficult. So I'm really, really sorry if for any reason that's you. Um, but I'll do my best, and I think this is just from a long day of parenting. It's not like I was at the game or anything fun yesterday. Um, so like she said, my name is Liz Lombard. I'm an occupational therapist, and I got into this field because when I learned about sensory processing differences, I quickly saw that there was such a lack of understanding in the greater public especially when it came to raising children. And I wanted to help as much as I could. So I became an OT because I really cared about this area. Um, and I, I made this presentation to support parents who are trying to understand what's going on with their kids. But it's really about supporting anyone who has sensory processing differences and understanding how the sensory systems work together um, and inform our daily life. Um, like Laura mentioned, we'll be taking questions at the end. If you have a question during, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you to ask the question to make sure it's captured on the live feed. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions as we go along as well. But there will be a Q&A at the end so we can really have some good back and forth. So a little bit about me. I know I mentioned that my passion for um, sensory processing is what led me to a career in OT. Uh, I worked, I've worked at schools with various ages from preschool all the way up through fifth grade currently. Um, and when COVID hit, I ended up needing to collaborate with parents because suddenly I went from working with kids at the school in that environment and thinking about what sensory stimuli existed in that environment to needing to support the kids at home and thinking about what environments were going on at home and being able to collaborate with parents really changed a lot of things. And I had families tell me that some of the strategies we used at home, they were able to use when they would go on trips or when they would tackle special events. And it was really empowering for me to hear that I was able to make a difference in their families' lives. Um, I'm also a twin mom, which means that I understand how crazy parenthood can be. <laughs> um, and I, I also love and cherish the chaos of parenthood. When we talk about sensory processing, it feels like this buzzword and this marketing term. Um, but sensory processing is truly just how our brain is interpreting all of our different senses. So all of that information coming in, how our brain is seeing it and reacting to it. And it matters because it's truly foundational to being able to feel safe, feel regulated. And we'll talk a little bit about terminology in a minute. And those things, we need to feel safe and regulated in order to learn. So I pulled up this pyramid, and I know it's very, very small, but the very bottom is our central nervous system. The very top is academic learning. And this is called the pyramid of learning, or the cognitive pyramid, if you wanted to, to Google it as well. Um, and the idea is that our, our sensory systems, which are down here as part of our central nervous system, they are at the foundation to things like eye-hand coordination, ocular motor control, postural adjustment, which is all below our daily living activities, our behavior, and our ability to focus and to decide what we're doing in order to learn. So when we think about the sensory systems, there's that wonderful movie with Bruce Willis called The Sixth Sense, and it should not have been called The Sixth Sense. It should have been called The Eighth Sense because there are actually seven senses that we use. So there's the ones we always think about, hearing, balance, sight, touch, taste, and smell. But then there's also proprioception, 
which is our ability to tell where our body is in space, and also interoception, which are the inner cues that tell us we're hungry, we're sick, we need to go to the bathroom. Those internal cues are a type of sense that are really critical. Um, and we stimuli as much as we probably should because they're such a huge part of our life. When we think about these two, it's really kind of our internal life or what's going on inside of us every day. So in terms of terminology, regulation includes both self-regulation and co-regulation. Co-regulation feels like another buzzword that a lot of people are talking about because a lot of times we talk about the children can't regulate themselves. Or they're having a hard time self-regulating. But really, being able to self-regulate requires you to use the front part of your brain, which is not fully developed until you're in your early 20s. So even our, even our teenagers need us to help them regulate from time to time. And even we have moments as adults where we need someone else to help us regulate. Um, but co-regulation is when you have someone else there helping you regulate. And it's really what we can reasonably expect of children is to be able to co-regulate. Meaning that when they're having a hard time, whether they're having a hard time processing different sensory stimuli or having a hard time processing emotion, they might need an adult to help them walk through how they're feeling, recognize that they're feeling that way, identify some strategies or tools to get back to a place of feeling safe, calm, and regulated. The next term, neurodiversity, is a term that refers to a group of people that includes both neurotypical people and neurodivergent people. And neurodivergence can refer to anyone whose brain is wired differently. So that can be related to, I mean, usually this term gets sort of generically labeled onto autistic people, but it also applies to anyone who has um, any sort of sensory processing difference. It can relate to people who have OCD or anxiety or depression or an acquired brain injury or a history of trauma. Anything that your brain is wired differently falls, falls into that neurodivergent category. And then this final term, I'm going to use the phrase sensory processing differences the most, but one term that has been used for a long time is sensory processing disorder. The reason that the language is starting to change around this is that more and more adults with sensory processing differences are saying, just because you can handle going to the mall and that feels good, doesn't mean that I have a disorder because going to the mall doesn't feel good for me. So the language around there is changing. Um, but sensory processing disorder is not recognized as a formal diagnosis in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual that most psychiatric um, diagnoses are included in. But it's a pattern of sensory-related behaviors that significantly disrupt daily life. So they can happen in isolation or concurrent with a variety of other diagnoses, like ADHD, autism, anxiety, or trauma. And I think it's really important to be aware of that. A lot of times, parents that I work with or adults that I work with, when they see sensory issues, they're suddenly worried that their child has a disorder or a disability. And that's not always the case. I mean, one, when children are young, and we're going to get into a little bit of the neuroscience, but when children are young, they're going to have bigger reactions to sensory stimuli because they are young and not able to regulate in the same way that adults do. But even if they just have major sensory processing differences, that can, that can stand alone. Um, the other thing, too, that I like to point out to parents is that you know, these diagnoses are labels and they can be information, but they don't need to be bad labels. They can just be information to help parents understand what's going on um, and actually ultimately help their child or, you know, if, it's, if, it, if they're a caregiver, that child develop a sense of identity that is probably going to have something to do with these. So just something to think about. So I'll say sensory processing differences. Um, especially because there can be such a huge 
difference from from child to child and from person to person. They might have some moderate sensory processing differences, but it's not majorly impacting them on a day-to-day -day basis. And then there are some people who are going to have major differences where they need sensory strategies and tools to get through their life in a way that's meaningful and gives them a, a sense of fulfillment. And it's not just driven by anxiety around those environments. So when we talk about being regulated or when we talk about being dysregulated, these are sort of the two opposite ends of what it can look like. So when someone is regulated, usually their eyes are on a specific task or a person. Um, they usually look like they understand what's being said to them. They're processing it. Whether or not they like it might be something different. Their body appears in control and they're visibly calm. But when someone is dysregulated, their eyes might be looking all around the room or their eyes might be closed if they're sort of in a shutdown mode. If they're not reacting or processing what is said to them, sometimes uh, I have children who you're saying their name, you're trying to remind them of something, and if they're truly not, they're not hearing you. They're not taking in what you're able to, or what you're saying to them. Uh, their body looks out of control. So I like to point out too that dysregulated isn't necessarily a bad thing. And I, I try to remind kids that I'm working with that when they're at recess or if they're, you know, opening presents on, you know, their birthday, their body might be dysregulated. They might be out of control, but it's not a bad thing. It's just that their body is, is out of control in that moment. Um, but certainly if they're having a negative experience, you're probably going to see crying, screaming, or they're visibly upset or stunned or in shock. And it's important to remember that while there's fight or flight reactions, there's also fawn reaction, which is sort of that like, you're in the headlights, I can't move, I can't process what's being said to me, I might close my eyes, I might crumple down into a ball, or I might just be standing, staring, not able to react. So in terms of what's happening in the brain when we're processing sensory information, if we notice right now, there are all these background sounds that we've probably, for the most part, been able to tune out, whether it's people walking by or a chair moving, or even like this projector has a little bit of a hum. Those are all noises that we've habituated to, meaning that our brain said, that's not important. That's not a threat. That's not something I need to pay attention to. So when sensory stimuli comes into our brain, our brain registers it and decides, is it important or is it not important? Do I need to notice it or can I habituate to it? So in people with sensory processing differences, input that a neurotypical person might be able to habituate to isn't necessarily, the, the person who has sensory processing differences isn't necessarily gonna habituate to it. So if there was background noise, like even the hum of you know the heater or the, you know, the, the air conditioner or something might be so distracting that they can't pay attention. And when I'm at, at work or in the schools working with children, I make sure that they're not sitting right next to that AC unit because I know that that's going to distract them for the entire, you know, 45 minutes that they're in the classroom. Um, the final step to this sort of system is a physiological response as needed, meaning that, you know, so if, if, a neurotypical person hears a loud alarm, their body might have a rush of adrenaline, they might look around to see what's going on, and they might start thinking about, you know, getting out of the building, that sort of thing. But someone who has sensory processing differences might hear the phone ring, and their brain might interpret that information the same way that a neurotypical person might, might interpret an alarm. So they might hear a phone ring and they might get that surge of adrenaline and all of a sudden they need a little time and maybe some strategies or tools to re-regulate and get back to a place where they can pay attention. Um, I'm thinking about the students that I work with in class, but even to get back to having a conversation with their friends if they're in a social situation. So I encourage you to take a moment and just check in with your sensory system. I know I mentioned some of the background sounds that are there, but it's even 
you know, what is the, the lighting level? This room is lovely and that there aren't like massive fluorescent lights above us. Um, there's some natural light coming in, which is great. And it's even what smells are present. Uh, a lot of times I'll work with families who, you know, they enjoy having their bath and body work candles going and things like that. But those smells similarly can be interpreted by someone else in a way that causes them to have like that fight or flight response. It's also important to recognize the ways that emotional regulation and sensory processing are linked. And I know you mentioned working with little ones who have big emotions. And emotions are processed in the limbic system, and that's also where sensory stimuli is processed. So the amygdala is this tiny little part of our brain that processes sensory input to determine whether or not we're safe, but it's also responsible for fear and for reacting to positive rewards. So when someone is in a state of high emotional arousal or they're having big feelings, um, their amygdala is working overtime, and as a result, they might appear more sensitive than normal to sensory input. And this is even like when I'm driving and traffic is really bad and I feel really stressed out, I turn down the radio because it's just too much and I need to focus is what it feels like, even though normally I have no problem listening to the radio when I drive, just as an example. So that's a really important thing to remember if you're working with children or just thinking about yourself, those moments where there are big emotions are times when there's gonna be more sensory sensitivity. Um, but on the flip side, we can use this to our advantage because introducing a novel sensory stimuli can actually support re-regulation. So something like going outside and stepping into a new environment or getting out um, something that's like a really, novel tactile input like shaving might help that person just have that, that ability to reorganize their central nervous system to re-regulate. The other thing that is hugely affected by sensory processing skills is motor development. So we need that body awareness when we're learning how to do things like ride a bike or write our name, because if we can't feel where our hand is as we're writing, we won't be able to learn how to make the strokes that we need to make right. Or similarly, if we can't feel what our legs are doing when we're learning how to ride a bike, we're not gonna be able to master that, that specific motor plan. It's almost like muscle memory. Um, you know, if you go to the gym or if you're into dance, you practice those movements over and over again because that really solidifies it in the brain. But if you don't have the proprioceptive awareness to, to feel that, then you won't have that feedback loop to the brain to help support that mastery skill. And that also can affect articulation. If you think about it, the way you move your mouth is a motor planning activity. So when I talk to families about when I'm working, you might not even be aware of some sensory differences, but if across the board there are some, I'll say inconsistencies with skill acquisition in all these areas, I always go back to let's look at what's going on in terms of how they're processing their internal senses. Any questions on anything so far? I think we're, I think we're through like the the heavy like neuroscience side of things. And I won't go too much more into that neuroanatomy or anything like that. But in terms of thinking about a child's sensory needs, um, you want to, as much as possible, address those sensory needs when they arise, whether it's avoiding noise, difficulty with clothing, or extremely picky eating. And I add that word extremely picky eating because all children go through moments they're, they're picking their for one reason or another, whether it's teething or, or something else going on. The second thing I always recommend to families is to get to know your child's sensory preferences so that you can make some predictions about future experiences to avoid or to minimize difficulties. And I never tell families, you know, oh, just give up on that activity altogether or don't do that. It's more about 
let's find some ways that we can make this activity pleasurable for everyone involved. And then use novel sensory experiences to support both the child's ability to calm as well as to engage them in a new activity. Um, a lot of times I'll tell families when their kids are really resistant to learning how to make their letters or numbers, you know, use, use shaving cream on the wall in the bathtub um, or, you know, finger paints on outside. I always say finger paints on an easel outside so you can make a huge mess of it things like that, or even going back to like the extremely picky eaters, I'll encourage them to let their kids play with food because touching those textures is the first step to getting them to tolerate those textures in their mouth. Um, so there are ways that we can use those sensory experiences. And I'll also go over some strategies that are sort of general strategies that work for most everyone to share. Um, and then finally, get to know your own sensory preferences because it can help you stay calm and regulated. And when you're working with children, in order to co-regulate, you need to be able to feel regulated as well. And I really appreciate this now that I'm a parent and I have so many moments of, okay, I'm trying to get to work. I'm stressed about a meeting that I have. I'm frustrated my husband didn't do the laundry. That's, that's not true. If he's actually watching the live stream, he would say I do the laundry all the time. But I'm frustrated about something and my kids aren't putting on their shoes. That's probably how I lost my voice yesterday was telling them to put on their shoes 10,000 times. If I know, okay, I'm extra sensitive to sound and my kids whining and screaming is going to set me off. So I need to step into another room, grab the discreet pair of earplugs that I keep handy in my purse to put in my ears so that those noises aren't quite as loud. I can use those strategies to help myself get through that moment and then to co-regulate with my kids. And especially when I think about um, when you're working with a child who has sensory differences, if they are dysregulated and upset and you're also dysregulated and upset, it's going to be very difficult to help them. And there's the oxygen mask metaphor where they talk about you know, on an airplane, they say you have to put on your own oxygen mask before you can help someone else. And I think that applies here because you can't help that child until you're regulated. And then when I think about quick sensory fixes that I share with families all the time right off the bat, you know, if they're avoiding noisy places, give noise canceling headphones. There's also earplugs, there's loop earbuds now that are really cool looking and are very comfortable for a lot of people. Um, everyone is walking around with like earbuds in their ears. So it's not even like an othering thing anymore. <laughs> In fact, one day, my daughter was wearing a pair of headphones at a museum, and someone came over, a volunteer, and said, oh, what are you listening to? And I said, oh, no, they're noise-canceling headphones. There's, there's no sound coming through them. So it feels very normal now to have headphones, and it's a very easy, quick fix that can help families get to go to places that they might have otherwise felt like they couldn't handle or needed to avoid. Um, if a child is avoiding a messy activity, give them tools. Don't force them to put their hands in it if they don't want it. If you don't like the way something slimy feels on your fingers, then that's probably not going to change. Let the kid use a paintbrush, let them wear gloves, that sort of thing. If they dislike loud appliances like vacuum cleaners or um, hair dryer, not that I ever have time to be a hair's parent, but if they dislike that sound, give them the control. Let them turn it on and off and let them experiment with it. Because controlling the sound makes it much more tolerable. If they have difficulty with clothing, then there's so many bag free, seamless uh, clothing options. There's compression clothing. I always tell families, too, if something is, is labeled as like a sensory shirt or something like that, you can usually find the same thing for cheaper. <laughs> Because that sensory, just like a wedding, if you put the word wedding in front of something, it makes it more expensive. It's the same thing with sensory. It feels like, so as an example, I've seen sensory compression clothing, but I've also seen families just buy um, the swim shirts that are tighter fitting and making sure that it's a, a tight size so that it's, you know, not restricting any movement, but providing, and that actually is supporting that proprioceptive input because just that giving the person wearing it more information about where their body is in the space. 
And then automatic toilets, the automatic flushing is just horrible. So I tell families to keep post-it notes, um, stickers, or to grab a piece of toilet paper, get it a little bit wet and stick it on the sensor because if you cover the sensor, then the toilet won't flush randomly. And then the child can actually control when it flushes. And the, you'll notice that the overriding principle here is, is giving control, letting the child or the person control whatever the sensory input is, because that is going to make them way more comfortable. So the sort of secret sauce, <laughs> so to speak, that tends to work for most everyone for regulation is heavy work, which is active proprioceptive input. Uh, when I think of what I do for myself as an adult, that's proprioceptive heavy work. I think of running, yoga. I inevitably end up carrying things around my house day. Um, but when I'm thinking about suggestions to give to to families and to my students at school, doing a bear walk or a wheelbarrow walk, a crab walk, a frog jump, um, up and down the hall a couple of times, doing or carrying a backpack with books or water bottles is a fantastic way to do it, um, to get that heavy work in. Drinking a smoothie through a straw is going to give a lot of input to the, the oral muscles. And these muscles here are actually pretty big. And for a lot of, a lot of kids, that can be incredibly regulating. Um, and of course, if you're drinking a smoothie through a straw, you're going to have to like really suck to get it. A tug of war or a pillow fight. Uh, playing in a body sock, which if you've ever seen them, they're they're called body socks, but you kind of it's all lycra, and you climb in, and then you velcro close the front, and usually they make them where you can put it over your head or you can leave your head out. But I'll just let students or kids play in there for a little bit. It's fun to get in, and again, it's giving that that awareness of where your body is. You're pressing against the lycra, and then the other the other suggestion I put on here is inchworm walkouts on a therapy ball or a foam roller, but that would be like walking out into a plank position with your feet balancing on something. And you could even do it feet balancing on a chair or on the ground. But that any of these are going to give you that sort of input to your joints and to your body. The thing that I like about these is they're active, meaning that the, the person is actively engaging in them as opposed to Sometimes we might do something called joint compressions, which is like squeezing, squeezing different parts of the body to give input. But it's something that you need to be careful about um, because you don't want to ever inadvertently hurt someone else. And it can be difficult to teach a child to do it. And if there's communication issues and you can't make sure that the child is feeling okay with it, and you would never want to put your hands on a child without knowing that they're comfortable with that. Um, there's passive ways to give that heavy work, but active really gives the child control over it because they're the ones doing, doing the actual work itself. And so some guiding principles that I always use are to validate sensory experiences, just like we're always trying to validate a child's emotions. We always want to recognize that what they're experiencing is truly happening to them. I think as parents, especially when I think about the mornings being crazy, getting out the door, it can be really easy to say, you're fine. Your shirt is fine. Your socks are fine. We need to go. You know, or your shoes are fine. We need to go. Your coat is fine. Leave it on. We need to go. Instead of saying, I'm seeing that you're really uncomfortable. And it's kind of tricky when, you know, if you have a child who doesn't want to wear their coat and it's negative 15 degrees outside, you can't let them stay outside without their coat. But at the very, very, very least, you want to validate their experience. Maybe they're feeling really uncomfortable. And in that sort of situation, you can go back to some of those active, heavy work activities and say, you know, are you feeling calm and regulated? Can we try to put your coat again? And then you're at least validating their experience. Um, which I'm sure that I am guilty of. And the second guiding principle is to always try and give control of society around sensory needs. So it might be, you know, to use the example of your winter coat. Your coat's not comfortable for you. Would it feel more comfortable if you were wearing your compression shirt underneath? Would it help if we took off your sweater, the extra layer? Um, 
and trying trying things and seeing if there's some options that might be more comfortable. And then trying to get control when you can. And that, that might look like, okay, 50 degrees out, it's sunny. If you don't want to wear your jacket, you're good at communicating when you're good at recognizing when you're cold, then okay, you don't have to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that one to you. Similarly, fostering and encouraging self-advocacy. And if you're doing those first two things, you are fostering and encouraging self-advocacy. The goal is never, and you know, I say here, desensitization is usually not the way to go and can definitely backfire. A lot of times I have families who say, oh, are they going to grow out of it? Are they going to grow out of these three differences? And really, the goal is, is more to help them advocate for what their needs are and regulate in a way that's effective for them and for their life. And adults, we're all regulating ourselves all the time. I mean, whether it's chewing gum or tapping our feet or taking a walk when we've had a long day, we're constantly regulating ourselves and doing what we need to do without about it. So what we want to do is we want to help children develop communication skills, and in the confidence to step up and say, oh, you know, I really need a break from this. It's too annoying. Or I don't like how bright it is in this room. Or whatever that is. So that we can help them get older when, they're, when we're not around. They can say to their teacher, this environment is uncomfortable because of X, Y, and Z. And then that, that adult can usually change whatever that is to help meet their needs. Um, and desensitization is usually not the way to go. I'm repeating that because I have seen, I've even seen occupational therapists, I've seen ADA therapists, all different kinds of professions who, or professionals, I should say, who might want to say, oh, that child really hates shaving cream. Let's practice getting them to like shaving cream. And um, that's, not respecting what their sensory experience is usually will backfire because if you make the child do something over and over again and it's unpleasant, the message that they're saying themselves over and over is likely, well, this is always unpleasant. I always hate this. It's never, oh, yeah, I can't do this. But I think there's very few situations where decent is, is actually warranted. Um, if a child has a really big sensory difference, you know, when I think about the extremely picky eater, there might be a situation where you might be desensitizing to some textures to make sure that, that the child's nutrition is met. Um, but really, there's rarely time to say, like, doing that is making you uncomfortable. Um, and I like to give families the example not going to a Metallica concert, that would be way too loud. And if you just made me keep going to Metallica concerts, it wouldn't make me like going to Metallica concerts anymore. No shade to Metallica. If I listen to it at home, I turn it down. Um, and I always try to remind families they do well when they can. And I think that this is always important to remember that no child is trying to make someone's life difficult. There, whether they're having a meltdown because of sensory overload or if they're having a meltdown skills, they still, they're not doing it to me. They're doing it to their children, and we can expect them to have a hard time with those things. And it's our job as adults to lead them. The that it's our job as adults to teach them their PC. It's our job to help them learn how to regulate their emotions. It's our job to help them learn how to make sure that they can feel comfortable environments that they need to be in day to day um, with the accommodations that we can help them find. So I wanted to share some further reading and listening uh, books that I highly recommend, a couple websites on Instagram people, and then there's a podcast here that I really enjoy. There's a lot of perspectives from neurodivergent individuals, which I think is probably our best source of learning because <laughs> They're the ones who are actually trying to support. So if you can listen to them, all the better. Um, but these, I would say that 
you can consider all of these vetted. Uh, sensory can be a big buzzword. And when I was trying to see if there were other podcasts that I recommended, it was overwhelming how many options there were. And I could tell right off the bat that I didn't agree with some of them. Um, yeah, so the books up top, the out of things child is sort of like the ultimate. It's been revised a couple of times, but it has a lot of good information anytime there's a sensory processing difference impacting daily life. But Sensational Kids is great for helping children, for thinking about ways to help children in the context of their family. Um, raising a sensory smart child, and that also speaks to helping develop those self-advocacy skills to make sure that the child's sensory needs are getting met. And then the everyday games for sensory processing disorder cultural activities is really nice because it, it's giving you all those activities that you can pull from it. Anytime you're working with a kid, anytime you have a child who's dealing with some of these sensory differences, it can be easy to overwhelm um, because it can be really hard to tease out exactly what's going on, what sense is it's overwhelming, is it only in this specific environment, but all the time, those activities, just having them there for you can be really helpful. All right, so I would love to open it up to questions because this is a lot. And I also feel like I've barely skimmed the surface on this. So what questions can I answer? What questions do you have, if any? Oh, and we can, we can bring the microphone, too. So mainly the most important one is to acknowledge that they are having how they're feeling or the the they can't express that well. So and not to think about they're doing this to make your life difficult. That's the choice. Yeah. With when they are difficult you can't or you think they make your life difficult. Right. Absolutely. So you are supposed to help them achieve to regulate them. To regulate. And when it's not going well in one direction, switch, switch direction, uh, do, do different activities. Yeah, absolutely. I think um you know one of the heavy work activities and I think you, you brought up something. You brought up when the child can't say what's going on, that that communication can be really hard. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because any is in a state of sensory overwhelm, that is going to be sort of offline until you can regulate again. Even an adult who has no problem might trouble saying what's bothering them or what um, so the, the biggest thing is acknowledging that something's going on and that you know, the way they're feeling is that the experience is not valid and being there for that sort of a to do that just by kind of exuding that empathy of this is really hard. See that this is really hard. It's sort of and then step two would be, let's try, and sometimes you can come back to, is this child to do a lot of rough play? It might be, let's do a pillow fight, or let's do tug of a child who, you've seen some, some yoga poses or something like that in the class, so you know they're familiar with it, so it's going to be, well, let's do downward dog together, or maybe it's, a child that you've seen them like playing in the bathroom when they're supposed to be washing their hands. Okay, we're going to go play in the water a little bit because that's a novel sensory stimuli that's going to help you regulate your central nervous system. But I think it's really important what you mentioned about that a lot of times they won't have the ability to communicate what they're feeling. And then we really have to remember that, that they're not going to be able to tell us exactly what's wrong. And sometimes after the fact, when they are re-regulated, depending on their communication level, then they might be able to say, oh, that was so noisy all of a sudden, or it was awful. 
that sort of thing. And then you can really problem solve, okay, so next time you're going to be in the back of the line so that no one's bumping into you. That sort of thing. And uh, sometimes I notice I ask some, let's say, one individual child, keep asking, and the third, fourth, they don't, they're not listening. So if I can catch myself, I stop. Talk, you know, give them time to maybe take yeah. two points. Yeah, I think that's, that's good. And that also, I'm so glad you mentioned this. I wanted to mention this because using Google can be so effective because, again, whether it's a sensory overwhelm or for whatever reason they're dysregulated, when that world offline, there's trouble. Language. And so if you're telling the kids, go over there, bear walk, play in a couple of they're not going to process any of that. So if you have a you always go back to. Sometimes, like in preschools, I see a lot of times they'll set up a calming corner. It might be as simple as gesturing to the corner. So the child knows, oh, yeah, I can go down. And there might be a visual there that. You know, of a child doing bear walk and a picture of, um, like, I, I call them presses, but just pressing your hands together because, again, that gives active proprioceptive input. Uh, it might have pictures of that. So, using visual and taking out the language component because that's so important in the process. A speech therapist that I work with, who I really love, has a t shirt that says, She is visual. And I love that because I think, as, or really, as anyone who's trying to help in that sort of situation, we're throwing so much language into the mix. But all that language can actually just contribute. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. I'm glad you brought it up. Any other questions that I can answer? Yeah. Thanks. Hope you can hear me through the mask. Yeah. Uh, I I'm an adult who's coming to the world having not knowledge as a child. And uh, what would you recommend for an adult trying to just go back and figure out how do I how do I be a kid again so I understand like what I can be doing for myself now? I think that is so, yeah. so hard, and I, part of why I got into sensory that I was with sensory differences, it was adult friends I had you know, who were near and dear to my heart and who would talk about their experience. And unfortunately, I a lot of people very invalidated experiences and were oftentimes traumatized. There's such things as environmental trauma. And when you're into a situation that is throwing your nervous system into a tizzy day after day after day, you're going to experience environmental trauma. So I think, I mean, I do know that Willow therapy, Willow integrated therapy on Jackson Road, that they offer some adult uh, sensory processing groups. And I also, I'll look it up to make sure, but um, I believe it's integrated therapy. There's a new place that I just found that's new specifically like OT and sensory processing with adults. But then also, I, you know, I've been learning a lot from like a handful of Instagrammers who are posting regularly about what their experiences are. And a lot of times just think about situations in a new, in a new life. So something like that could be really helpful because you might want to share their experiences and understand it. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Oh, my God, that's what was going on. Yes, I found that already. Yeah. And, uh, relative to his grandson, who's about two, and just sort of becoming verbal. So, again, like, you can't really say, well, what about this? What about that? What's the real problem? You just know that he's not happy with something. Yeah. And um, there's 
you know, uh, I'm familiar with dog training in the sense of you've got this this time span in which you can work with it, and then you're past the point. Okay, and, and for for example, with his grandson right now, there's a really short window, and if you can't guess it right or change it quickly enough, then it it's over. Yeah, and um, he becomes angry and you know pushy and it's like so. What would you recommend to sort of change that space where you have time to work right does that make sense it does yeah okay. yeah it changes try to like elongate that wind yeah yeah i guess i will a huge thing that i tell families to do right off the bat is to start keeping a, a log uh, and it can you know you can print out like a simple sort of like schedule like half hour mark make a note you can figure out a whole happening when we're coming inside, taking off clothing, or it's happening about an hour after we eat, so it might be related to those interoception here, um, you know, around digestion. When you can keep a log, you can start to see patterns that can help you predict more. And then you also might be able to see if you're jotting down, okay, well, we tried this strategy, worked, didn't work. You can come up with abbreviations for yourself just to make it quick. Um, then you can see like, well, this strategy worked. So let's introduce this strategy earlier and yeah. see if that gives us more time in that window. And I, those, those heavy work activities are um, usually like my go-to. I'll pull it back up again. I would say that that would be what I would kind of start with, some of those animal walks and things like that. Um, doing like a burrito blanket where you roll the kid up in a blanket and give them some, some squishes through the blanket. Um, those things I think might help elongate that window, but when you can track it, you can really start to notice some patterns. And it's, it's so important because, especially when you can't communicate and don't know exactly what's going on, which again, even a child who has beautiful language, who's six or seven or 10 years old, they might not be able to tell you exactly what's going on in the moment when they're really yeah, overwhelmed. Yeah, tell you what's wrong. Yes. I am not okay. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So when you look and find those patterns, that can really help. And there usually are some patterns involved, and it, it becomes like the detective work of working through that and trying to see what it is. Yeah. But thank you for sharing that because it's there's so many more adults who are saying, I was totally ignored as a child, or I was like not only made to feel othered but i was punished at school yeah because i wouldn't take off my hat to do the thing that i did yes. right. exactly and exactly that's the last thing i want to do to any child now exactly know? yeah absolutely i know and i i try to let new ot's know about that because i've seen that within the ot world like i said i've seen it in other professions as well where it's like oh this is hard for them well let's keep practicing until it's not hard anymore and that's really unhelpful it's just the setting someone up for failure and and it, it's not something you would ever do to an adult either you would never you know make them go to that metallica concert over and over again so i'm going to ask you one more question yes please and this this relates to i think just safety in the world as mm -hmm. well that children's no needs to be respected however when you get little kids, they're practicing that no, and sometimes that no needs to be a yes, like like that coat that has to go on. Right. You know how do you how do you weave the weave that? I mean, I think you just try to think outside the box as much as you can. Um, you know, and I think it's important to know too that even even if a child isn't saying no, if they're showing you no, because again, like if language is shutting down and they can't tell you no, but you can tell that they don't like doing, I think respecting that and starting by, by honoring that no, honoring that piece of communication is step one. But then, you know, like, like I said with the code example, well, if it's 50 and sunny, okay, that's fine. Um, if it's negative 15, we're gonna try to find a way to make that comfortable. We have families who have said, you know, we can't, I'm trying to think of an example, we can't go to the mall because it's too loud and too bright. And, but we, we have to be able to go clothes shopping or whatever, or the grocery store is a better example because you have to go get groceries and that can be a really overwhelming environment. So then it becomes, okay, well, the child doesn't like that. 
let's try noise canceling headphones. Let's try sunglasses. Let's make sure we're doing some calming preferred activity before we go to the grocery store or even, you know, letting the child have a preferred activity, like a, a preferred toy or something to hold on to in the grocery store. That's a comfort item, things like that. So it's, it becomes about being flexible with, with that, that response to the no. So it's, if it's something that needs to happen, it's like, you know, no kid wants to go get shots at the doctor, but it's important. And so we find ways to make it more comfortable for the child. And I think that's where it's really important. It's not about forcing the child to like just power through, which I think our generation was told a lot. That doesn't work. That only makes things worse. Yep. Um, that only contributes to the environmental trauma. But if it can be, you know, I, again, the validation, I see that this is uncomfortable for you. Let's find a way to make it comfortable. And there might be things ultimately that, you know, aren't worth it. If a child hates putting on a costume and is miserable the entire time they're trick-or-treating, they might not want to trick-or-treat. And maybe that's fine. I mean, if the child doesn't want to, you know, then maybe you just don't do it. And maybe that's something that, so the thing that you get to decide as a family and with the child, and you're always validating and helping them understand. And I think one thing I would want the people that I'm working with to know is that just because something is uncomfortable doesn't mean that they, they can't, if it's something they want to do, there's a way they can probably find to enjoy it. So part of the work that I do as, with my sensory concierge business is working with theaters and venues and children's spaces like zoos and museums to make sure that they have some things in place to support families where there are children's children with sensory processing differences because otherwise those families just can't do those things very easily and that's not fair when we have the information and education that we do now. Yeah. There, there's also the whole process. You know, yes. we go there and we know it's other people are going to look at us and think that our child, whatever. Oh, right. You know, and you kind of just have to let that go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I've heard a quote, and I, I use this quote for a lot of different things in my life, but I heard the quote, uh, and I don't know who said this, what other people think of me is none of my business. And I think of that all the time as a parent. I mean, I had moments where my twins are having a full-on meltdown in the middle of Meyer, and people are walking by, and they can think whatever they want, because... I'm doing it to the best of my ability, and they are welcome to step in and try it out. <laughs> you know, so I, I think that that's I'm a really good point. Yeah. yeah, and I I will say too that I think when we model for our children, you know, it's okay to need to do something differently. That they're going to feel that much more confident in self advocating for themselves as they get older. And I try to tell, I mean, I was bringing like a like a wobble cushion in for a student at work the other day at one of the schools where I work at. And another kid said, hey, that's not fair. I want that too. And I said, well, you're wearing glasses. Those are cool glasses. Does everyone in the classroom need a pair of glasses? And no, you don't. So well, this is going to be available for the student. And the nice thing is there's so much more education happening around sensory processing differences that there are a lot of teachers who have a ton of flexible seating in their room. They have a ton of universal supports in place so that there are calm down corners where a kid can go take a break if they need to. So we're seeing a big shift, but unfortunately it has taken a lot of adults coming out and saying, my childhood was miserable. Because of the next and so here are the things we can do better now. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you for asking so many good questions. I appreciate it. All right. If there's no more questions, thank you so much, Liz. I'll leave my email if anyone wants it. Yeah. Oh, yes. Good contact info. Yeah. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you for coming. Daylight saving because you chose to come. So I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.